Today, in honor of Sustainable Seafood Month here at Google, we are joined by Michael Passmore of Passmore Ranch and Chef Bill Nyo of Crew in Sacramento, and they are going to tell us a little bit more about sustainable seafood, sustainable seafood farming, aquaculture, and I think they're also going to make some something delicious. Hopefully so. Hopefully everybody enjoys it. We're going to go for yeah. it. Yeah. We're going to try. try. So food thank in you your guys. mouth. Okay. It's going to happen. That, that will be the end result will be delicious food in your mouth. I'm going to go ahead and commit to the delicious okay. right out of the gate. So I don't have to make it happen, but I, I can convince you guys are going to make it happen for all of us. So tell us, when I say sustainable seafood farmer, what does that even mean? It's a big word is what it is. I, uh, sustainable. You know what? Uh, we almost have dropped that a little bit just because it gets thrown around so much. It's not even in we're, we're post sustainable. It gets thrown. I, I think we are. It's like postmodern or something. Yeah, it's we're meta now. But it point. is. It is super important for farmers like us uh, or any farmer, whether they're land based or protein based or anything. Sustainable is part of our DNA, or it should be, because if we're sucking up all the resources, then we have nothing left. And so it's absolutely been a part of our ethos from the get-go and when it applies to uh, when it applies to fish it just means that we're not sucking all the resources for feed or for water we're recycling doing all these things that we need to in order to continue to produce that delicious protein so paint the picture for us of your farm what is it what is it like it's 86 acres but Guns, in, in, beers, motorcycles. <laughs> Giant um, dogs. I can attest to that. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> no, in okay. all seriousness, it is. It's 86 acres. Uh, we're about to double that. Yeah. And with some other locations in Oregon and around the corner from us uh, because of great demand. But uh, it's a bunch of outdoor lakes and combined with some tanks. And so we do what we call kind of a bastardized uh, recirculation system. Uh, because we feel like I'm not so focused on just fish. I want to use that water over and over and over again. And so to kind of paint that picture, the water comes up. We have a great aquifer, like a spring there comes up, this beautiful clear water that we don't have to pay for uh, like, a, like the bottled water. We just drink ours. And it comes through and it starts growing little fish into bigger fish. But then once we're all done with that, then it goes into the vegetables that you're seeing here today. And we grow some vegetables with it too. So at the end of the day, the water doesn't just go away and go down a river or something else. We're using it over and over and again, part of the sustainable part of things. So how many of you have heard of farm-raised fish in a negative context? It's okay, fess up, fess up, we all have. Yeah, right? I think traditionally <laughs> you hear about, ew, farm <clears throat> fish, wild, right? That's the way. So tell me why that's not necessarily true. You know, I think you asked the right person on that because people say, number one, what's your favorite fish? And my favorite fish is, well, mostly what Bill cooks me but uh, or slices, but it's really, it's a good fish. And so to me, a good fish is a good fresh fish uh, that's been handled well and then processed well. Well, that can happen in both wild and in farmed environments. I think the key to really nicely raising a fish is we were talking earlier about all being shoved into an elevator. Does so anybody enjoy, like you've been in an elevator, like in New York, I was there, and I think there was, we were going to the top of that really tall building, and there was, there had to have been 25 of us in this thing, and we were just like, like this. And it was, I'm just breathing that person's air, and it was just, and then the other ones in the back one. <laughs> Touching all of their germs. So really, you know, my mentor told me, uh, it's really not that hard, Michael. <laughs> just give the, yeah, like this just guy. Like that. I, I was in the <laughs> elevator next to him. And, uh, <coughs> but that's how, that's how animals get sick, too. You mm -hmm. shove them all in together way too close. It's not good for them. So on our farm, we try to go with a much less uh, of a density. And so everybody's got a lot more room to run around in there. We're feeding them a higher quality feed because we believe the people like Google here uh, are willing to pay a premium for the increased cost because we're not growing it more dense. We are feeding them a higher quality feed and uh, keeping them the other key to it is just continued low stress. Bill, I told you that metal, I, you know, okay. we're going to get in <laughs> trouble with that. I thought the Ansel system was going off. Um, but that's really the key. Just not crowding them. We don't have to medicate them. We don't have to throw all these drugs at them. We just keep feeding them good food and then they raise well. 
Plenty of space. Yep, plenty of space. Good food. Good food. Good water. Yeah. The other thing Good with the water too, bad with farm fishing or farm fish is all the waste when they're packed up so much mm -hmm. that all their waste is going back out in the wild that affects wild uh, fish and, and, and water. Like he said, none of this water is going back to the wild or streams. It's going back to his crops that he's growing. We so. push out the nutrient rich water, and that's code word <laughs> for uh, fish poopy, stuff. Poopy fertilizer. Yes. Yeah, fertilizer. But seriously, it is some of the best fertilization you could ask for. Mm -hmm. And so we put it out in our uh, crops, and that's what uh, grows some of these flavorful vegetables here. So it's not just about taking care, better care of the fish themselves. It's also about taking better care of the environment and all of the Absolutely. other impacted. It's kind of like raising good kids, right? You're mentioning that, you know, give them a great environment to run around, feed them well, give them room to run around, and what do you know? You got healthy kids, right? What other advantages are there to farming fish? I think for me, the thing that fascinates me and where we're going with some of our things is not just in the rearing, but in the rearing, if I can keep the stress level of that fish at a very level area, if they're not stressed, then they're not using their energy uh, in other ways. So we can keep them just super relaxed there. They're growing, they're super healthy. But I think the real advances have been in processing. And for instance, you know, when you bring that fish in in a calm state and you're able to process that fish without it in a super frenzy, you see these, you see these videos and such where you know, they're pulling them in from something and they're just all going crazy. I mean that has an effect on the musculature and the flesh and everything else. So when we're doing that in a more calm manner, and then what we've learned too, like you're gonna enjoy the texture of this uh, sturgeon in particular, because it's a real meaty fish. And everybody thinks, who thinks, uh, you know, straight from like the hour after you catch it is the best way to always eat a fish? Anybody, anybody? Okay, it's reasonable. We all hear it's fresh is the best. That sturgeon, if we put it on that grill like you're gonna see us doing, and we did that right out, if we just slaughtered that fish, it would, it would, like a rubber band. Rubber, leather, It yeah. would just yeah. be chewy. Uh, these fish need to resolve rigor, and so they relax, and it's all about those processes and techniques. And That's in our environment, yeah, I've never heard we that. get to do those certain, things. Certain fish is good to have fresh, certain fish you wanna age, you know, tuna you want to age. I use this fish at uh, both of my restaurants and we take it even a step further of uh, letting it go through rigor. We actually, this meat's really, really dense once you guys try it later and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, we take it a step further. We actually freeze it in a slow freezing process just to soften up the, the meat. So just to make it uh, not as tough. So that's Changes the molecular structure just a little bit for it. Slowing it, free, uh, freezing it slowly yeah, and then, then defrosting it. Yeah, you're quite a team, so how did you meet and start working together? I thought I was going to be the farmer's market king. Um, I had this weird dream that uh, I was at the San Francisco farmer's market. I bet a bunch of you guys have been there. At the ferry building? Yep. I was wandering around, as I usually do, probably with a beer in my hand or something. And uh, I look around and I say, wow, this is cool. I grew up in Texas. We didn't have all these farmer's markets everywhere. We ate well, but uh, it's more beef running around. And I looked there and I was like, why isn't there like fresh fish here, because that's kind of been a new thing there. 10, 12 years ago, they didn't have that. So now I was looking around, I'm like, wow, there's a whole lot of these all over our area. I could bring my live fish, because I didn't really realize that you could process fish at that time. Live fish, oh, yeah. we like were a going, tank. We were going live. Swimming around. Oh yeah. <laughs> Pick your fish. So I'm getting to that, and you know, there's a really neat guy, Randall uh, Selland, of the kitchen in Sacramento, kind of a patriarch there. Bill did his externship there, and uh, so he sees me at the farmer's market, my wife and I, and sees these live fish, and he's just, oh my gosh, what's going on? Can you bring those to my restaurant? I'm like, yeah, you call, I haul, sure, what's the problem? I don't think he realized that they were coming in live, <laughs> and I didn't realize that some chefs don't know how to cut a fish either. I'm like, well, you're a chef, don't you know how to cut a fish? Uh-oh. So yeah, so this, this little pocket knife has processed a whole lot of fish. <laughs> well, Randall was eating at uh, Bill's restaurant. Bill's restaurant's kind of like the spot that, the secret, not so secret spot that I can't get a seat in anymore. But uh, he was in there and he started talking to Bill about it. And so Bill was my second chef ever to, to use our fish. And 
we used to pull the fish bus right up there, unload the live fish, and in it went to Bill, and that's how it Picked all started. Picked the fish, pulled it out, Love gave, tap. It, gave it a tap, and then went inside <laughs> the restaurant. Yeah. So obviously, Bill's your second, or but who? What other chefs that we would recognize are are you now working well, with? Well, uh, Matthew Acarino. We were over there defacing him over there. He's a uh, both a very good friend, but uh, I don't know. Do you guys dine a lot out in Napa and Bay Area? I'm assuming, and uh, so pretty much. Anybody with the Michelin star or James Beard award or all those things. So uh, Mr. Keller and his restaurants uh, uh, utilize us and uh, Christopher Costow and those guys, uh, good friends of ours. And uh, I could just go on and on. Uh, Dominique and her places. Tell you, Cran. Yeah, many, yeah. many chefs who have joined us here and, and the ones you I would... think they've all graced this uh, kitchen, haven't they? Oh, well, we're trying. Yeah. But not all. We're <laughs> on our way. I've got a list. <laughs> so tell us what you're making today. Uh, today we're doing a really simple recipe uh, that anybody did at home. Uh, that's poke. Poke is a Hawaiian dish usually traditionally done with uh, tuna and onions, salt, sesame oil. But today we're doing it with sturgeon. Uh, we're using Michael's sturgeon. We're going to sear it real quick, and we're doing it with all the veggies from his farm. The fennel, the onions, the purple daikon. is all from his uh, ranch and farm. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Right there. And what was your inspiration for this dish? Uh, this for. is somewhere the, the ranch and farm, and also, uh, was it last year, where we went to Japan to check out the Tsukiji fish market, to check out uh, the, the fish scene out there, and... Uh, Right across from the market, there's a little market, right? And yep. all, all these little, little stalls and street food, and everybody was just doing like trashy bowls or, or fast grab and go. It was just bowls with rice, and they'll just cut chop chunks of fish. So this is something similar we're going to do. We're going to do little poke bowls with uh, his fish, the trout, sturgeon, and his veggies. Actually, we were looking for knives at that moment, uh, too, because oh yeah, the yeah. Ninox uh, shop was right around the corner, and so that was part of it. We were hungry. Yeah. <laughs> the market just moved, I heard. Did they I don't think it's shut down yet. Cause, yeah. uh, it's Yoshi, going Yoshi's to? going to, yeah. If you, there's a fella, I wish I had his handle. If you guys love that Sakiji market, it is one of the coolest places. And one of our good friends is a generations old vendor there. He has been posting some of the coolest images on uh, Instagram just, you know, for remembrances for him. He grew up there as a little kid yeah. working his father's market. And uh, it's been pretty cool to see that. And speaking of sustainable... He is one of the few guys over there pushing sustainability, and he gets a lot of pushback from that over there. Really? Yeah. What are the main reasons that people would say it's not beneficial? I don't know if it's not so beneficial, but there's not, just a lot of not culture. Not as easy to make a lot of money. It's just the culture, the stigma that wild is still better, and you, you want to, the best sushi restaurants want to say, oh, all our fish is wild, or wild bluefin is just like... It's the stigma of thinking wild is still better. It's just yeah. a stigma. Yeah. Yeah. Oddly enough, uh, he was the one who began to bring our catfish over to the Sakiji fish market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here sometimes catfish is looked upon, you know, uh, I don't know. But uh, it's one of the, I love the texture of it. And once again, you raise it well, it's fantastic. He was, uh, he was at the Monterey Bay and Bill was making, and uh, we started uh, doing a catfish uh, sashimi, basically. Yeah, you yeah. remember when he was, <laughs> we were was slicing right. away? And he liked and, it and yeah, yeah. he brought it over. Might have been a little yeah. sake involved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Well, I was uh, super excited to try the dish. Let's okay. go for it. Get cool. the siren. So yeah, so we got okay. a little sturgeon filet here. Like I said, we, it's been uh, froze and then uh, defrosted just to... Uh, make this meat a little bit more tender because this meat's really, really dense and firm. And when you freeze it slow, it kind of breaks down the, the meat. So we're just gonna mark this real quick and uh, hopefully not set off anything here. And it just takes a moment on each side. Does anybody have any questions while we're watching this yeah, questions, deliciousness questions. cook up? I raise uh, white sturgeon and we also make some caviar from that. And I do a striped bass, a black bass, a, what else do I do? Uh, a catfish and a silver carp. And then I co-op with my neighbor on the trout, although we were probably going to start doing that in our uh, Oregon project and do a freshwater salmon up there as well, probably. Now you should ask me, why do I raise those fish? 
<laughs> because I was riding on the coattails of my mentor. I moved in next door to a guy who's been doing it for 35 years now, world-renowned expert, but mainly kind of going back to uh, raising fish well. You want to raise them in what their natural environment is. And uh, so for us, the temperatures really worked for that. So you have to have the least inputs into that. And so those temperatures, the environment, the seasons, uh, all work out very, very well for those fish. Uh, somebody might say, well, why don't you raise a saltwater fish? And it's just because why, why try to create something that isn't already existing there? Uh, there's a lot of great, uh, great saltwater fish being raised, but they're raised in saltwater environments, obviously, and you don't have to recreate that and put a bunch of salt into it. Uh, so I was wondering, you mentioned that um, farm-raised fish isn't bad if it's raised correctly, mm -hmm. but if you're in the store, how do you know? I'm sorry, I missed the last part of if it you're there. In the store. So I think one of the best references, and I used to not think this uh, several years ago, but they've done a lot of work since, is Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch. I really think that they do a fantastic job of researching. They put, they put the effort into it. They are listening to all of the communities involved. And so they have both an app and uh, you'll oftentimes see that referenced on there. And they do not, they don't sell their ratings. They don't, uh, you can't get that rating if, uh, if you're just really nice to them. And I think they're just a really reputable organization that, that I look to and that we converse with uh, a lot on our rearing practices as well. Does that help out? Yeah. Cool, so we just come find all the ingredients. We got the uh, sturgeon marked off on the grill, some of the purple uh, daikon, uh, the fennel, onions, green onions, uh, a little sesame oil, sugar, and soy. So we're just going to toss everything together. I mean, there's been many, many variations uh, to do poke. I mean, you could use sea salt instead of soy and do sesame oil if you're gluten-free. Um, you can add whatever you want in there, the veggies, you know. One thing I forgot on your question, too. Seafood Watch not only rates farmed fish, but also wild fish, which is super helpful because they really do spend the effort, the money, and all the resources to track what species are being overfished, underfished, and not just that worldwide, but also regionally uh, in different fisheries. Uh, there's just a huge amount of resources going into it, and it's, it's a major reason why we support them. Cool. You're just spooning it over a little bit of uh, steamed organic brown rice from our friend's farm, Ruin Forsman Ranch. Right there. What else? And we got a little bit of a uh, trout from his uh, ranch as well. Just putting that on the side. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could talk more about the diet of the fish that you raise and how you keep that sustainable as well. Huge, huge question all the time. I'm sorry we overlooked that. So we are a very, I'll speak, I'll speak from a couple of different areas. I, I had the pleasure of serving as a president of our whole association for the state. So I can speak on that level a little bit. There are a lot of uh, initiatives into vegetarian feeds, these type of things uh, that are claimed to be more sustainable. Uh, I feel like we're learning still a lot about that. We're also, each fish is a little bit different in the way that they want to eat. So those are things that we have to take into account too. Uh, just like people, some people they're, they're vegan or vegetarian, they like to eat that way. Some of us are carnivores and we grow and eat better that way. Uh, fish are much the same. So for my farm, what I do, is for instance, the sturgeon has a diet, it needs about 68% of its diet to be protein. And so we feel like as we've played around a little bit uh, with different proteins within that, we feel like fish meal is still a big part of that. But I limit it to less than 15% of that 68%. Let me know if I'm boring anybody with all these percentages and such, I can geek out for a while on this if you want. Uh, but what we found is, is that Fish is a large part of their diet. So we feel like they need to have that uh, scent, if you will, 
uh, for them to be attracted to that feed and to grow and be healthy. But I did want to limit it because I didn't believe in just throwing a ton of fish meal into it uh, needlessly when I can add other proteins from other areas. And the fish meal that I do put in there, uh, we spec that to be scraps uh, from other, pro uh, excuse me, other processing areas. And so I feel like that's a responsible way to still get fish meal without sending a boat out and harvesting that uh, just to go to a fish, fish, uh, fish feed, so to speak. Uh, the other, well, about 14% of it is fat. And then the other are just the other essential vitamins and elements that uh, that, that fish needs to grow as well. Uh, fat's actually a really important thing for sturgeon in particular, uh, because if you reduce the fat too much, then they're not reproducing right, and all that great fat's not going into that wonderful row that uh, some of you guys may like with a little bit of salt and cured and uh, caviar for you. So the fat's very important as well. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably speaking a little ahead of myself there. Yes, we contract with a feed manufacturer, and we tell them, we say, hey, here is our spec, here is our ingredients. We want this to come together, and I want it to be certified to that. I want it to be certified that it's chemical free. I don't want any other uh, uh, hormones. I don't want uh, steroids in there. I don't want all this crazy stuff that maybe some other people might like in their fish feed. That's not for me. And so they certify that for us and it comes out into a pelleted form of different sizes because when we have little fish this big to you know a couple hundred pound sturgeon, they're all gonna take different size feeds. So uh, we, have, we have talked about, though, at some point, maybe a finishing with some fish or something in there, but we haven't gotten there yet. The first, is there a reason why you chose to sear the fish today rather than just serve it purely raw? Oh, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> I'll let you tell. I, I, <laughs> this is a, a textural thing and to add another layer of flavor to bring a little smokiness to it, too. So that's the main okay. thing, yeah. Great, and then the okay. second question also for you, Shifno, uh, is, uh, were there any learnings from Tsukiji Market that you're going to take back to your restaurant um, and, you know, go forward with Tsukiji Market or, or Japan lot. otherwise? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. I think uh, one of them he was just talking about he didn't get into was the feed, was he explained the feed of the f uh, sturgeon, but something we talked about was uh, finishing it. You know, we learned some of the fish farmers in Japan would finish their fish with citrus peels or something, they'll grind down citrus peels and put mm -hmm. that in their feed too to change the flavor of the meat. And that's something yeah. we've been talking about, like he wants to mess with soon. That's something learned from the ski market. Yeah. I learned that, what was the top tuna auction that day? It was like 20,000 bucks or something like 20, that. 25,000. And yeah. so we're walking in there, there's the fresh and the frozen auctions. And so we're looking around and we see these numbers on the fish, these little stickers. And I think that top one was like number four. And so I'm thinking, well, number four, maybe I want number one. Where is number one? You know, and all these are graded. Well, you go over into the frozen aisle and we saw like number rating 487. <laughs> It was huge. Yeah. So their grading process is that broad. I thought that was fascinating. And the uni auction was, uh, was super, super tight mm -hmm. and probably even more, more scrutinized more, yeah, than, more the tuna, than tuna, auction, wouldn't you yeah. say? Yeah. yeah. And other than that, just the sheer and immense size, the variety. Uh, just the amount of uh, fish that is taken out of the ocean that's why we're going back to sustainability. Everybody wants wild fish, but if you see how much fish was going through that market a day, and that's how much is coming out of the ocean, you will want to start looking for another source of fish, which is farm-raised fish. A good you make a good fish. point there. I, yeah. I'm not against wild fish whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I enjoy a great wild fish. Mm -hmm. I think what mm -hmm. has been impressed upon me, like by mm -hmm. Sakiji, is just that by all accounts, uh, our, our wild fisheries are fully utilized uh, because all of us are eating more fish and there's more and more population and everybody's growing and everything. And so that part of it, we speak about sustainability, that doesn't seem really sustainable if we continue to pull more and more and more. And I'd like to continue to enjoy nice fresh wild fish too. So I think that a good farmed fish has a real place in the, in the community of seafood. So that brought something to mind for me. So we recently obviously lost our crab season for the most part Boy, this year, we? right? So What an impact. 
that's something that may continue to happen with other fish populations, right, in the wild, as our climate shifts and all these other things are happening. Is this yet another reason why kind of controlling as many variables as possible could be beneficial in terms of maintaining our supply? I think it it does offer oftentimes, I, I'm not immune to having issues uh, with raising animals. Animals sometimes do have health issues or they die or otherwise, or, or have issues like the, the crab or something. But uh, certainly we don't deal with some of the oceanic uh, weather forces and warming or otherwise, whatever your particular philosophy is on that. And it does seem that uh, some warming is causing some algae and you hear about the fish dying in a, uh, uh, a port or something. And it's because they're schooling fish, they've lost oxygen in there. And so they swim and swim and swim until they, until they perish because there's just not enough oxygen. Uh, I do think that that will have an effect on and on. And I hope that other, other folks, raise, aquaculturists, continue to raise good fish to help offset that and do it in a responsible manner that's not overly consuming resources. Are you seeing an, an uptick in that idea of aquaculturists? Not so much in California. Oddly enough, you know, I live in an area where there's uh, quite a few aquaculturists, uh, some, some uh, long-time standing guys. But uh, in California, we're a fairly small little industry, uh, oddly enough. That's surprising. Oddly enough. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think that we will see more as California continues to think about what offshore looks like for us. Can that be done responsibly? Can that be done in a way that... Uh, doesn't interfere with uh, wild fishing, uh, environmental concerns, uh, you know, view sheds, I believe they call them there. Uh, I think as we can look into that, I think you're going to start to see a lot more investment in that and a lot more production, uh, healthy production uh, for our state here. Are there other parts of the U.S. where it's a more common practice? There is. Uh, I believe the Gulf of Mexico is doing it. Uh, I'm not sure on the East Coast right now. But uh, some of those areas are also uh, a lot easier to basically put a straw in. There's a uh, abalone farm, uh, some friends of ours, and it is one of the coolest operations you've ever seen. They've got a huge straw, and it comes in, and they raise millions of pounds of abalone, which is delicious. I could eat that forever. And, uh, and then it goes back out purer than it came in because the abalone are a filtering device. It's one of the coolest things I've ever seen out there. That's fascinating. I love the ingenuity there. <laughs> um, anybody else? Chef. So for the benefit That's of our friends who are going to watch this on okay. YouTube later, one of our chefs <laughs> is wondering if you'll tell us a little bit about your process from the moment he places an order, what happens, how fresh is the product that's actually being delivered? Sure, let's see if I can. I'm going to back it up just a few minutes, though, here. So when I first started serving guys like Bill, it was all just cut to order because our volume really wasn't that big and we could, we could make that work. So it was still alive. <laughs> well, this is true. It was really yeah. cut to order yeah. there. Real fresh. Yeah. So then we advanced into that Bill would say, hey, I need this. And OK, so we'd process it and we'd bring it over to him pretty much day, day, day thereafter. I mean, really short supply chain. Well, when you start dealing with uh, the Googleplex here, it's enormous. I mean, Bill and I just got crushed over there doing uh, sushi service. It's like this wave of humanity came in, and everybody wanted <laughs> sushi. And I'm like, did any did any of you join Ooh. them for sushi today? No, uh -huh. you did. I missed. Were you that. the guy I'm that so about better. knocked out our friend Kimio? <laughs> was, was that you? Like, somebody gave him a elbow to get out of the way. But that what, does not sound very googly. <laughs> I don't think that happened. It was good sushi. So they're, they're like nothing standing in the way. Uh, but what Chef brought up, what has been really fun for us, and what's been really cool to work with, like Lauren over there. Hello, Lauren. Oh. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> Is working through how do we get processed an enormous amount and still maintain our standard of very, very tight. You know, now the sturgeon, we, until, uh, we don't bring that out for four days. It really needs four days. So, but that's factored into our timeline. The rest of it is day after, day in maybe 12, 13 hours tops, depends on when it gets served to you. But in order to keep doing that, they've really been working with us with throwing their orders out 
earlier, this is what their technology and everything does for us, and they're forecasting, and it's been, what an exercise for us too, and a real pleasure to work with, you know, the folks that get all of you guys this food, to be able to utilize that to, gosh, we're bringing several thousand pounds a week here to, to Google, and to be able to do that in a manner that keeps that, that lead time, you know, less than 48 hours oftentimes. And that's pretty incredible at that kind of scale because otherwise what's happening is if it's out on a ship or if it's uh, across the country, then it's processed and not necessarily anything bad about that per se. It's just a lengthier supply chain. And so then it hops on a truck typically, comes over and then goes to the distributor, comes over to chef there and then comes to you guys. So we've got an abbreviated supply chain when we partner with. Pretty much, it comes from uh, comes from our ranch right down here, and uh, our drivers leave at uh, bright and early at three thirty in the morning, and to to get it to you guys. That's amazing. We try to partner with farmers locally as often as we possibly can to make sure that not just your proteins, but your veggies and all of those are as are as fresh and local as possible. You guys do an astounding job. For, it's for the immensity of the operation and the quality of food. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. My lunch here was great today. Yeah, we serve 150,000 meals a day. Is that all? That's it. <laughs> no big deal. That's it. Globally. Yeah. <laughs> and Bill's looking forward to a 12 person uh, sushi bar in the future. <laughs> He's like, I want to serve 12 people a night. That's what I want to well, do. That's it. <laughs> yeah, sushi is a, a hot commodity around here. We don't have too many sushi bars at Google, but you certainly Excuse saw the me. demand. Um, anybody Pardon? else? Last couple questions while, while our uh, dish is pre finished up. And I will say as you go over there, if you're in Sacramento, Go out of your way to go see Bill at Crew, and it's on uh, J Street. I've been all over the world. I love to eat sushi, and the sushi that I've had sitting at Bill's bar has been bar none, some of the finest. His sourcing, his uh, his skills. I, I can't say enough about the guy. I hope his head doesn't get too big for his hat right now. But <laughs> anyways, what question? Hi. Yeah. Um one of the reasons I try to get most of my animal protein, or almost all, from seafood is, this is kind of terrible, but I feel like uh, fish and things are sort of lower consciousness than they are. land animals. But I, I'm curious, from you working so extensively with fish, if you feel that's true. I, I, mean, I know there's sort of debate amongst the scientific community about sort of what lobsters go through when they're boiled and things like that. I'm more curious sort of your experience on on it, whether this is true. <laughs> I am more familiar. I'm glad you brought that up because I do. I see that um, uh, animal welfare is a hot topic. And I think there is, um, I haven't seen what I would consider to be irrefutable proof uh, showing that a fish has the mental capacity to experience pain. Uh, when we talk about pain and those kind of things, it's different when you have a reaction. Uh, a reaction to something that is a that is an environmental thing. If you you know I don't know. Does anybody remember Roly Polies? Everybody knows what those are. I'm a Texas boy. We used to get our little magnifying glasses out and you know zzz, you know and like they're not experiencing pain per se. What you saw happening there was just a, uh, a physical reaction to that stimuli. So you're spot on. Their their neuro uh, makeup, a fish. Uh, and I'm not talking about mammal fish, uh, I'm talking about shrimp or bass, these type of things. They do not have the same processing abilities as say a human or like my cute little puppy or otherwise to experience it in the same way that some of, like you said, your upper, upper level animals would. You had talked a little bit about uh, stress before, trying to keep the stress levels equal. And I'm, just, I'm a bit more curious about whether in your experience of being a fish farmer for a while now, like, you sort of get to know them a bit better. <laughs> right. Um, I'll clarify, when I talk about stress, I'm talking about in, in energy. So if we are, for instance, if I am thinking a whole lot, if I have a lot of troubles or something and I'm stressed out, I'm not talking about if I'm happy or sad in that. I'm talking about the energy that I may be utilizing in order to deal with those stresses. Same thing, I'm talking about that with the fish, not that they are happy or sad. I've, uh, from a personal or an anecdotal, if you're asking for that, 
I do see behaviors. I don't see personalities in those fish. They're, they're really terrible pets, quite frankly. But uh, certainly you, amongst some of our larger sturgeon and such that, uh, that we're growing out for caviar, sure, it, can I relate behaviors to almost cute personalities, so to speak? If I really wanted to stretch that far, sure. But really, all they're hoping for is that I'm coming by with feed when they come up and they bring their nose up and they're looking going, hey, hey buddy, you got any feed for me? Because that's what they're used to. That's what they've been, you know, Pavlov's dog, basically. You ring the bell and they get the food there. I, so you, the sturgeon, you raised them for seven, I should like have brought seven, some, right? Eight. That's the question. Where is the caviar? <laughs> <laughs> so you raised them for like seven, eight years, and then in their first uh, full reproductive year, you cut them open, take out the caviar, and sell the flesh. There are several techniques that I've read about for taking out caviar without killing the fish. Why have those not caught on? Lots of reasons, actually. So first of all, I will say that I'm learning that I really don't like the first reproductive cycle. I like the second reproductive cycle. It's a stronger, more robust egg, these kind of things. But uh, so you're talking about no-kill caviar, right? That sounded like a fantastic idea because, shoot, why couldn't we take a resource, get caviar from it year after year after year, and we wouldn't have to grow them up to 7 to 10 years old? Wow, wouldn't that be great? So here's the problems. In any facility or otherwise, like when they design this kitchen, they put a certain amount of stations in there. And so it makes it difficult to facilitate more than what it's able to do. So in our environment, you have things that are sized to certain sizes. So as that fish continues to grow in kind of a fantasy world, so to speak, of no kill, soon you'd be dealing with a 400 pound fish. That can be troublesome. Bill, how is it to deal with 150 pound fish? Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they are extremely strong, strong, strong animals. We call them like monkey strong because when you're in their environment, they, they outpower you. So there's that aspect of it. But when we get into just pure quality of caviar, and I've experienced some of the no-kill, I think it's a fascinating idea. But what I'm not real excited about is that in layman's terms, basically, they're injecting a hormone into that fish so that you can spawn it, just as if we were spawning fish to make up our next fish class, so to speak. So you milk that fish, basically pushing, pushing those eggs out uh, through the vent there. Well, those eggs then, from those hormones, they have a very porous cell wall to them. Porous cell wall is code word for mushy eggs. And as a general rule, people who enjoy caviar are not looking for jam. They're looking for a nice bead, a nice pop, these kind of things. So those folks knew that and they said, gosh, we don't want that. We have to figure out how to close up that cell wall. So then they dip it into a chemical that then chemically alters that and makes that cell wall tighter and a much tighter bead. None of that really, really gets me too excited, quite frankly. I suspect maybe at some point in time, if they could modulate that chemical to make for a medium or maybe not as tight, because I prefer, personally I prefer a, a caviar that I don't have to chew. And so those are almost like, did you ever like decorate your uh, cupcakes with those little BBs? Yeah. That's what it kind of reminded me of. Um, flavor was fine, flavor was okay but I was chasing the caviar around. So I think those present some issues for that technology uh, to go forth, but in theory, it sounds absolutely fantastic. I think there's just some logistical challenges to it is all. Not there yet. Yeah. Maybe in Yeah, the like a lot of things though. Everything's advancing and uh, certainly open to uh, if they can solve that one. I don't think I'm gonna be the one solving that one, but uh, we'll see what everybody else does. Hi. So Hi. different fish are sold at different prices. Is it harder to raise some kind of fish than others? And Actually, is your pricing model based on difficulty? Is it a skill level? I, I think it's both a skill. I think there's some market, what the market will bear or not bear. Um, like salmon, for instance. Salmon has an awesome marketing team. I mean, we <laughs> all expect salmon to be on the plate everywhere, right? Um, so I think that there are issues of market that go towards price. Um, 
Mainly what you're looking at though is inputs. So what does it cost to raise that fish? And that's not necessarily given to expertise. It can be like higher protein, we we're talking about feeds there. More protein in it, those type of fish, that feed costs a lot more. So we have to factor that in in feed conversion ratios. I'm gonna nerd out here for a minute again, but uh, the better the conversion ratio is, the more you can produce at a lower cost. But yes, yeah, some of it is uh, rarity or expertise. Like we, uh, we are going to find out how well we did at striped bass this year. I know that we hatched nearly 10 million eggs. Nearly 10 million eggs, but I don't expect to get all of those fish out. Uh, we will find out when they go into about a uh, little could, larger than a sack fry. Could you even accommodate 10 million striped no, bass? No, and that's, and that's why we hatched so many, because we like knew a, It's like a wedding. That, yes. I hope not everybody Exactly. <laughs> Over-invite. <laughs> Over-invite. <laughs> Our striped bass are over-invited right now. So what is the most complicated fish you've attempted to farm in terms of number of inputs or complexity of the inputs required? Right now, I will say hands down my striped bass. They are... Nice. Uh, Difficult. They have been extremely challenging this year. It is a fish that we're just getting into. We see them as a great fish. Someone was asking, why do we grow what we grow? Well, striped bass used to be a great fish that a lot of people would grow, but they grew it for stocking purposes because they didn't travel well to the live Asian markets because once they went in, they're such a fragile fish, they would die. Well, live market, dead fish, that doesn't quite work quite as well. But for us, in a processing environment, it's a fantastic fish, but uh, we really, really struggled with it. This was our first big year into it, and it's a, it's a challenging fish to spawn, really challenging. What's the easiest one you've done? My friend, the catfish. <laughs> the catfish <laughs> love to propagate. They just love to propagate. You put a little music on Do the work beside for the you. lake, and uh, it, it is. It's pretty simple. We put out uh, milk cans, basically, that creates little caves for them. We're recreating that, and you would not believe that it's these antique milk cans. That is the secret to it. We've tried to replicate it in plastic and all these other things because those milk, cr milk cans are not easy to come by. And people want like a million bucks for these Super silly things Super romantic for a oh, catfish, yeah. though. I mean, Yeah, so you put those out there, and uh, you go out in there, and usually Papa Catfish is in there guarding the eggs. And, but all in all, super, super simple fish to, to deal with. I like it. And that's actually because we probably don't have to mess with them you too much. interfere that much, yeah. yeah they just Back kinda, to the interference thing. Well, like yeah. we said, streamline the process. Right. <laughs> Do you have most underrated or fish that you see becoming more popular in the next couple of years? You'd mentioned catfish earlier. Ooh. Bill, what do you think on that? What's the Most, dark horse? Yeah, underrated fish that you think is coming up. Like We want to get in early. Like they got a weak marketing team. Yeah, they got a weak marketing team. <laughs> Salmon, what's, what's coming so up? over it. Yeah. What's next? <laughs> mm. What do you think, Bill? I'd, right? say, I'd say it's the sturgeon right now. You think? Yeah. Sturgeon. Yeah. I mean, we are seeing well, it, see it a lot, on a lot more uh, restaurants menus. Restaurants not really, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're seeing it on a lot more menus, and I think it's just interested people like y'all that uh, are willing to go past that easily marketed or that familiar fish. Like, I'm an adventurous eater. I'll, I'll eat anything, anytime. I mean, we had some fantastic horse in Japan. It was fantastic. I really loved it. Uh, oh, did you say horse? Horse, absolutely. Like H-O-R-S-E? Yes, like, Mr. Ed. <laughs> wow. So I guess the sturgeon, I'll, I'll go with him on that. I, I wasn't going to go to one of our fish specifically, but I think that that caviar production is rising. And so through that, the, the level of uh, sturgeon uh, is out there more. And I think there's more resources behind it. So I think you're going to hear more about it and they're taking really good care of that fish so that they get a great row from it. So it stands to reason, I, I think Bill's probably right that that would be an up and comer. Please but join me then. Thank you guys so much <laughs> for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>